So this is Taylor. Taylor is a little girl that's really into music and also into birds. In school, she's one of the cool and hip ones, but at the same time, she's pretty strict and has a very complex mind. Taylor can run very fast, but sometimes she also runs quite slow, and no one really knows why. Like most little kids, Taylor has a lot of dreams, and her biggest one, she always wanted to have a pet. But not like this, she actually always wanted to have a dinosaur. So one summer, Taylor went on a school trip to Switzerland. And when she came back, she was super excited to tell her parents about all the amazing things that she'd seen and done in Switzerland. So she ran back to her home, and there he was. Dino. He was just like she always imagined him to be. He was a little old, but that was okay. That just made him mature. And he was still super fast and dynamic. He had this kind of weird sign on his body, but that just made him unique, so she liked it. And the two of them were quite happy together. After a while, though, Taylor realized that having a pet is quite some work. And especially that communication is hard. They seem to, be, to speak a different language. Taylor, on the one hand, is pretty strict, while Dino doesn't care that much. And he has these weird things sometimes, where he mistakes Taylor and everyone else for a duck. He seems to go by the rule, if you walk like a duck and quack like a duck, you must be a duck. So the two of them realize that they have a problem and they need to figure out a solution. They need to find out how to better work together. Hi, my name is Matthias and I work on MindNote for iOS and macOS. It's great to be here at Apple. It's been an amazing conference so far with the best coffee ever. So please give, give a warm round of applause to the organizers and everyone involved. <laughs> for doing this. You're doing an amazing job, thank you. So when I was brainstorming about what to talk about at App Builders, I thought, huh, it's a conference in Switzerland. Which better topic would there be than speaking about languages, and speaking about different languages and how they work together? So this is how this talk came to be. But what about this name? A couple of weeks ago, I asked on Twitter, which image comes to mind when you think about Swift and Objective-C? And apparently, people have feelings about this, because I got some replies, like this one from Megan. This is how she would summarize the experience. Other answers were quite poetic. A Swift wearing a suit, driving an old, reliable Volvo. I especially like the last part. Maybe the car is heading towards the sunrise. Isn't this a nice image? Others were just as poetic, but a little more concise. Dinosaurs versus robots, or even more on point. And then, then there was this answer. Inset's joke about Avengers Infinity War being the most adventurous mashup ever. So I thought, why not steal this from my talk? I feel by now this joke has already worn off a little bit, so I'm sorry, but I already submitted it back then. <laughs> Um, so back at WWDC, when Swift got announced, we were all pretty excited, right? Objective-C without the C. I mean, now we know Swift is everything, but Objective-C without the C was just a marketing slogan. And Swift 1 actually was quite rough, right? So at MindNote, we were toying around with Swift a little bit, but we weren't really using it because it didn't feel ready for production. With Swift 2, we started to write our unit tests in Swift and our watch app to gain a little bit of real-world experience. And with Swift 3, after the great renaming, we finally started to integrate Swift into our main code base. Today, with Swift 4.1, we are at like nearly 50% uh, Swift. So since a while, we follow the rule that new code gets written in Swift, unless there's a specific reason not to. So you might be in a similar situation as we are. You might have an app that was written in Objective-C originally, and at some point, you added Swift into the mix and ended up with a mixed code base with both Objective-C and Swift in there. But there are also other reasons why we would have a, Swift, uh, a mixed code base, like performance, for example. While Swift is pretty fast most of the time, there are certain situations where Objective-C can be faster, or where you might even want to drop down to C or use C++. 
or you're dealing with third-party code that was written in one language or the other, and you want to integrate it into your project. And on top of that, some things are just easier to do and better suited for one language or the other, like reflection, for example, which is kind of baked into the DNA of Objective-C, which being a very dynamic language, or NSProxy, which you can't even use in Swift. So don't get me wrong, I really, really love Swift. It's a, I think it's an amazing language. And at the same time, I love Objective-C. So I sometimes get a little sad when I feel like that our community is a little divided. There's this Objective-C camp that loves Objective-C and hates on Swift. And then there's the Swift camp that loves Swift and hates on Objective-C. I think we have two great languages here at our disposal with unique strengths. Swift has its strengths and Objective-C has its strengths, and we should use them both. So this is what this talk is actually about, on how to use both languages and, and use them to your advantage in one app. So what if Dino wants to talk to Taylor? This usually works pretty well, because Taylor understands everything that Dino is saying. There are just a few things that sound a bit weird to her. So if we want to use existing Objective-C code in Swift, there's not a lot we need to do. It works out of the box. And there's a tool called Clang Importer, which does the heavy lifting for us. It translates existing Objective-C constructs into Swift. And as we all know, naming guidelines are quite different, with Objective-C being very verbose, and Swift trying to focus on clarity and being shorter. So Clang Importer does the translation for us, and usually it nails it pretty well. But sometimes we want to fine-tune it a little bit, and there's stuff that we can do to improve this translation. So if you want others to understand you, you need to convey a clear intention. And this can be done by making things more explicit. And I'm a huge fan of making things more explicit, of making implicit assumptions explicit. So I feel that this is a great side effect of Swift, that Objective-C actually has gained amazing new annotations and features over the past couple of years to make things more explicit, to make it easier to convey your intention. Because Objective-C was invented in the 1980s, so it's a pretty old language, but it has undergone some big changes in the last couple of years. We got properties, class properties, designated initializers, instance type, NS enum, NS options, nullability annotations, or just recently lightweight generics. So these are all things that you can use to improve your Objective-C code by annotating it. And while they greatly improve how Objective-C constructs are translated to Swift, they also add a ton of value to Objective-C code only. So even if you're not using Swift at all, using this makes your code more clear. Suddenly, we don't need to assume anymore what's in an NS array. It's right there in between angle brackets. We don't need to assume anymore whether a variable is supposed or supported to be nil or not. It's right there with nullability annotations. On top of that, there are a lot of annotations that are solely there to enhance how Objective-C code is imported into Swift to improve the interoperability between Objective-C and Swift like NS Swift name, Swift unavailable, typed enums, refined for Swift, Swift no throw, typed extensible enums, and many, many more. These are also annotations that we can use to annotate existing Objective-C types or methods and make them behave like first-class Swift citizens. In Objective-C, we often have like a bunch of string constants that represent possible values, like NS attributed string key, for example. But this is not type safe, so we can pass in any string actually. If we annotate this type with NS typed enum or NS typed extensible enum, it automatically gets translated into an enum like struct in Swift. So suddenly we have gained type safety in Swift for a feature that was actually written in Objective C, which is quite amazing. And then there's a third category of things that we can do to improve. We as developers always want to make our lives easier, right? And that's a good thing, so we want to have convenience. And you can do crazy stuff with macros, for example, to improve the convenience of you as the developer. So if you want to start some discussion in your company, I would encourage you to sneak this little code snippet in into one of your next pull requests, if you have a mixed code base. 
var and let for objective C. This is the objective C way of doing type inference with underscore underscore other type. And this is quite controversial. There are people out there that hate it, and there are people out there that love it. I personally really like it, for, because for me it's all about making things easier. So it's easier to context switch in a mixed code base, because suddenly we have the same construct, var and let, in both Objective-C and Swift. And on top of that, it encourages constness in Objective-C. I mean, sure, we could always use const directly, but who actually does that in Objective-C? At least I haven't seen it used out in the wild a lot. And I feel like it just comes more natural with var and let, which we are already used to from Swift. So it has changed the way how we at MindNode write Objective-C code, because we now default to constness and only change it to var if it's actually needed. There are many other things that you can build with macros, like for example, you can build your own defer for Objective-C. So if you're into this kind of topic, I highly encourage you to check out the PSPDF kit blog, because they've written some really good articles on the topic, and they do crazy things with their Objective-C code base. So I might have gotten some inspiration from their blog post. Or just go and talk to Peter, because he's here as well. I'm sure he's happy to talk to you about this kind of subject. So let's take a look at how we can use these annotations to actually see live how this transforms Objective-C code and how it changes the Objective-C code when it's imported into Swift. There you go. So I had an app idea. Like every one of us has their favorite words, right? So I wanted an app that displays the best words in different languages in a tree-like structure. So we have this entity node here that has a title and the language specified. And this is just a, method, a function to, to build up this tree-like stru structure. So my favorite German words are obviously Fernweh, Fremdschämen, and Hals Krause FX. <laughs> and my favorite English words are Kindergarten, Doppelgänger, and Lederhosen, mostly because they are actually German words. <laughs> so yesterday at the party, I met a, a Bavarian guy that promised to show up in Lederhosen today. Has anyone seen him? He's here. Where's your Lederhosen? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice job. And my favorite Italian words are allora, ciao, and grazie. It's because I can't speak Italian, so I just chose simple words. Um, so let's take a look at it in action and see what happens if we run it. It crashes. OK, so let's see what's happening. Conveniently enough, someone has already um, named this variable crashing word. So it's crashing here because we are creating an entry without a title and a language. And we don't actually want to do this. We want to prevent this. So we don't make, want to make this possible. So let's take a look at the node entry, which has this title property, the language, the parent node, and the child nodes to build up this tree structure. And then we have this initializer, init with title language. But since it's an NS object subclass, it inherits also init from the superclass. So what we can do is we can mark this initializer as our designated initializer. And we can also mark init as being unavailable with underscore underscore attribute unavailable. So if we build the code now, we get an error saying that init is unavailable, which is exactly what we wanted. So we now only have this one way on how we can instantiate node instances. So let's get back to our node class and see how this class is actually seen by Swift. So let's take a look at the generated interface. So we have an open class node, which is a subclass of NS object. And then we can already see some problems here, because there are like a lot of exclamation marks here. Basically, everything is implicitly unwrapped optional, because we didn't specify any optionality. And we want to fix this. So we can use NS assume non null begin and NS assume non null end. 
which basically marks everything in between those statements as non-null. And now we only need to annotate the ones that are actually nullable, which is the parent node, because the tree needs to end at some point, and these two parameters here, which are nullable as well. So if we take a look at the generated interface again, this looks way better already. All the exclamation marks are gone. We have an optional for the parent. So that's quite an improvement. And if we build it, we'll get some compile errors, because now all these optionals are obsolete, and we can actually fix this. We'll let Xcode fix it for you, so fix all issues. And now all these question marks are here gone as well, and we're dealing with actual non-optionals. So let's get back to our node interface and take a look at the generated interface again to see whether there are further problems. We have this language property here, which is of type string. But this is kind of weird, because we don't want to specify any string. We want to limit this to only the languages that we support. So there's something we can do here to improve. And that is also, there is this child nodes array of type any. But we know that our child nodes are of type node, so we want to specify this as well. And then there's this function here, get level sibling index with using unsafe mutable pointers, which isn't really swifty, right? So we're going to find a way to fix this as well. So first thing, we want to annotate our child nodes with generics, with Objective-C lightweight generics, which already changes the type of the child nodes. And now we get a warning that this force cast that we've been using here, where we um, iterate over our child nodes, is now not needed anymore because child is now correctly assumed to be a node. And if we take a look at the language type, we can see that this is just a type def for any string. So of course it gets imported into Swift as a string. And we have some constants for English, German, French, Italian, and Romance. These are the languages that we actually want to support. So if we annotate this type now with NS typed extensible enum, what magically happens is that this type gets turned into a struct in Swift. So if we take a look at the node interface again, we can also see that language is now of type language, which is great, exactly what we wanted. And if we build again, the compiler complains that now this language English should be replaced with language dot English. We can fix all of them. And we can actually replace the language dot with just a dot to make it read even nicer because of type inference. So if we take a look down here, we see that we print uh, the recursive description of the root node. But I actually named this root node, and I don't want this to be named just root. So what happened? I want, to, I want it to be like this. So if we take a look at node again, it's named root node here. But Clang Importer automatically removes the node because the class is named node as well. So we can use NS Swift name to override the automatic, the automatic name and specify our own name, which is nicer. And then there's this method get node level and sibling index, which doesn't really have a Swifty interface. So what we can do is use NS refined for Swift. So what this does is it actually imports this method with two underscores in front, so it's gets turned into a private method, and we can add a nicer API in an extension. So in Swift, we could, for example, use a tuple that returns the node level and the sibling index. And we can simply call the now private double underscored implementation to forward the actual implementation and not um, repeat ourselves, um, and have a nicer API in Swift with this tuple instead. So let's see if everything builds. And let's run our app. And there you go. It prints the best words in German, English, and Italian. So this is one thing that we can do to actually improve how existing Objective-C code is imported into Swift. And now I just need to find where the mouse is to start the presentation again. There you go. All right, now we've seen how we can improve how Objective-C code is imported into Swift, but what about the other way around? What if Taylor wants to talk to Dino? It's a little harder that way, 
because Dino doesn't understand everything the tailor is saying. And Taylor sometimes needs to find simpler words and constructs that Dino can actually understand. So if we want to use existing Swift code in Objective-C and call it from Objective-C, there are certain limitations, but there are also things we can do to improve this. And it all starts with add Objective-C. This is what we use to annotate functions, methods, types, protocols as being available in Objective-C. And of course, we can also specify, similar to any Swift name, a new name for the other language. But what about my tuples, enums, structs? I love them so much in Swift. Can I use them in Objective-C? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's a short and a long answer to this question. The short one is, no, you can't. Because tuples and Swift structs and enums with associated values are simply not possible to be re represented in Objective-C, so we can't use them directly. But there are things we can do to work around this issue, so let's take a look. Let's assume we have a class that's written in Swift, and we want to use it in both Swift and Objective-C. So let's break it down. This class has an inner type mode, which is an enum with two cases, dragging and node creation, and both cases have associated values. And we have a designated initializer, init, mode, location, that simply takes this mode and sets up our dragging state. So since this enum has associated values, we can't use it in Swift, and therefore we also can't use the designated initializer in Objective. Objective-C, sorry. We, of course, we can use it in Swift. And therefore, we can, can also can't use the designated initializer in Objective-C because it uses this type. So what we can do is add some convenience initializers that only use types that Objective-C can actually represent. So that take the node IDs directly or the view model directly and then internally construct the enum and forward it to the designated initializer. And of course, we need to mark these with add Objective-C to make them available in Objective-C. So this is great. Now we can instantiate our class in both Swift and Objective-C. But suddenly, we, all, we have three initializers instead of one. And this clutters our Swift API, right? Because we don't want these to be used in Swift. And if you're like me, this kind of thing bothers you, because you have code lying around that you actually don't want to use, or that you don't want to be used. So fortunately, there's another annotation we can use to fix this which is add available Swift obsoleted 1.0. Basically, what this does is it marks this method as obsolete in Swift starting with version 1. So as weird as it looks, it actually works, uh, because now we can call this method from Objective-C, because it's marked with add Objective-C, but we can't call it from Swift, because it's obsolete there. So now we have these two convenience initializers that we can call from Objective-C, and our designated initializer that we can call from Swift. So this is one way how we can work around these limitations. We can provide new API that only deals with types that Objective-C knows about and can handle. But there's an even longer answer to the question, what about my, stru my structs and enums? Can I use them in Objective-C? But now we're entering a whole different world, and I call it Dragon Zone. So be aware of the dragons. There's a protocol called underscore Objective-C bridgeable that allows us to bridge Swift value types to Objective-C classes. And this is actually what's used in Swift to bridge the shiny new value types that were introduced with Swift 3 to their Objective-C counterparts, like URL to NS URL or index path to NS index path. So we can use this as well for our code. But there's a little caveat, just this little underscore in front. This is a private protocol, so we're not supposed to use this. There's been a proposal out there for an official protocol without the underscore, but this one unfortunately got postponed. So until then, we are left with either using the private protocol that you didn't hear of from me, or finding other ways to work around this. Optionals are great, right? Because they add more clarity to our code we instantly see and know whether a variable can be nil or not, and the compiler even enforces this. Except when we're dealing with a mixed code base, because suddenly we can have a method or function 
that has a non-optional parameter in Swift, and we can call it from Objective-C with nil. And the compiler allows this. And depending on his mood, you might get a warning or not whether you can figure it out. But it's definitely possible to compile. And if you run it, you simply crash with exception bad access in Swift. And there's actually no way to fix this in Swift directly. Because you're dealing with a non-optional, which is guaranteed to be non-nil, so you can't even check whether a variable is nil or not. You have to fix this on the call side on Objective-C, which of course is the right way to fix it, because you're breaking contracts, you're calling a function that expects a value to be there with nil. But this can be quite hard to, to find all situations, and if it's a method that shouldn't really crash because it's not really important or it's not dealing with data, then you probably want to find other uh, ways to work around this if you can't find all call sites. So what you can do is you can, for example, change the parameter to be an optional or implicitly unwrapped optional, because then you can guard against it being actually there. Of course, this is not a really great solution, because now you're changing API con, uh, your API contract, and now suddenly a non-optional parameter has turned into an optional one. But this might be better than crashing in certain cases. At the end of last year, we shipped MindNode 5, which was probably our biggest update so far. So we were busy working on the update. And a couple of days before we wanted to ship the update, we realized that we were leaking memory. But we weren't just leaking any memory. We were basically leaking all of it, like nothing ever got destroyed. So this is a disaster, right? You can't ship an app that doesn't destroy any memory. So we had to fix this. And we were using uh, the memory graph debugger. We were using leaks instruments. And they were there, the leaks. We could see them. We could verify them. But they didn't make any sense at all to us. Like We couldn't figure out where the actual problem lied. And the code looked correct. So Thomas, a coworker of mine, used Git bisect to identify the commit that actually introduced this memory leak. And sure enough, it was a commit by me. So um, we were looking at this code. And what I did in this commit, like we had this Objective-C class this, that was doing a little bit too much. So I refactored it and extracted some code out of it. And along the way, I turned this into a new type in Swift. So I converted the code from Objective-C to Swift. And we were looking at this code. And still, we couldn't figure out where the problem lied. It looked correct. So Thomas had an hypothesis. What if there's actually a bug in Swift? So he rewrote the class again in Objective-C, and the leaks were gone. So this was great. We could ship our update. We were happy. And after we shipped our update, we had a little bit more time. So of course, we filed the radar and the Swift bug. And we all know the process, right? Radar is like quite tedious. You put in stuff and never, ever hear back again. Except things have changed, and it's not always like this. Because Joe Graf jumped onto our bug, and he identified the minimal code sample uh, needed to actually reproduce this memory issue. So if you have a class that's a subclass of NS object in Swift, and a variable of type any hashable, and you cast it back to the original type, you leak. So this is where it leaks at the print statement in the end, doing the cast. And we had filed this radar and Swift bug on November 23rd last year. And this bug got fixed on Swift upstream by November 28th. So it literally took them five days to fix this bug. So I just want to say thank you to everyone out there working on Swift, working in the open, because it's really great how this worked out. And it's so nice to have a community around this and get actual feedback pretty quick. We still are op ship our Objective-C solution, but that's a different story. So looking back, Taylor and Dino actually figured out ways on how to improve their communication, how to better work together. And there's a lot of things we can do to make things more clear, to improve our clarity. And we have two great languages at our disposal, Objective-C on the one hand and Swift on the other. And I think we should embrace a world with two or more languages just as we do here in Switzerland. Thank you.